A very happy new year to all of you from us at Raj Sabha TV and a very warm welcome to a special episode of India's World. As 2018 begins, we're looking forward to India's new challenges in its foreign policy and its rise as a global power. In a fast-changing global environment, how will it strengthen its old relationships and forge new ties? Joining us on the discussion today, we have an esteemed panel. We've got Mr. Shishadri Chari, member of the BJP National Executive, Pavan Verma, former diplomat and former JDO MP, and C. Raj Mohan, foreign policy analyst, joining us in studio. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me here on this special episode of India's World. Um, if I could start with you, Mr. Chari, uh, what were the major foreign policy goals uh, you know, of the government in 2017, and were we able to achieve most of them? You see, the foreign policy goals of uh, any government does not change with the change of the government. Mm -hmm. Basically, foreign policy is all about securing India's self-interest, India's national interest, and pushing the Indian viewpoint and increasing our acceptability in the world forum as much as as far as possible as much as possible so it is a it's a it's a continuous process and foreign policy formulations are a work in process work in progress mm. it keeps on going another feature about the foreign policy is that you cannot have a standard five year foreign policy like a five year economic plan or five year agriculture plan mm. Foreign policy is something, it's a very dynamic aspect of it. So it changes according to the changing geopolitical situation in the world. Yes. But I think whatever, uh, uh, <clears throat> whatever agenda that uh, the Prime Minister wanted to set in 2014, the most important element uh, in his uh, thinking was that we should secure our position and regain the strategic position that we have lost, at least to begin with in the region. Mm. So all his concentration started with the region, neighbors and immediate neighborhood. That is why he invested in, he invited all the uh, neighboring country, heads of neighboring yes. countries for his swearing in ceremony right, and the from there members, he began. Yes. And I think overall if you look at uh, the uh, 2014 to 2017, mm. there have been a number of achievements okay. where we have been able to push India's interest further into the domain of the world geopolitical scenario. Okay. Mr. Varma, any of the highlights according to you of 2017? Uh, you know, we had Trump, of course, taking over as the U.S. president. Uh, a lot of questions on how he would be treating India. But then it came as a good surprise. He did focus a bit on, quite a bit on India as far as his Afghanistan policy was concerned. So in that sense, some of the highlights that you feel uh, you know, where India really uh, took a good position as far as 2017 is concerned. Well, two things I want to reiterate what mm. Mr. Chari said. First of all, foreign policy is a continuum and it is therefore does not change if a government changes. Mm. And all foreign policy must be guided by national self-interest. There is no other yardstick except national self-interest. Where I disagree with him is that while there are contingencies that may come up in the immediate deployment of the instrumentalities of foreign policy, every country must have in some way a strategic doctrine, both for the short term, yes. mid term and long term. And I think India is a country which is still in a sense, it's work in progress to forge that strategic doctrine. If you ask me what is the highlight of 2017, it would be our engagements in our own backyard, which is our neighborhood. Mm. I think there much more needs to be done because we cannot hope to be a superpower if we remain bogged down in our own neighborhood, especially with regard to Pakistan and to China. So these for me are the biggest challenges for India today. Mm -hmm. All right. Do, do you agree with that? You know, it, the Modi government, of course, started with a neighborhood first policy. Uh, and to a certain extent, it seemed to be working. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, somewhere, especially last year, uh, things went a bit haywire. And, uh, you know, there was there's a lot of question on, you know, whether neighborhood first is now becoming neighborhood lost. Do you agree with that? <laughs> That's a good one. But, uh, you know, I think I just want to say something on foreign policy in general. Yes. Uh, foreign policy as both of them have said, it's a continuum, it's a dynamic process. And we're not the only ones that, just because you run Indian foreign policy, that doesn't mean you have the freedom to do what you want in mm. the international mm. system. The system is full of sovereign actors. Even the tiniest Maldives 
to China. Everyone yes. is playing their own game. So you have to constantly adapt to this dynamic environment. And I think that's, that's the, the, the biggest challenge. There, I think, two things have happened last year. One, the election of Mr. Trump, who has surprised the world by the kind of turns he has taken on free trade, mm. on globalization, on open borders, yes. and on alliances. So what he's saying is really fundamentally different from the America that we've known since the end of the Second World War. So I think the uncertainty in the U.S. political trajectory is a huge variable that, is, that has mm. been put into the world. And I think this induces a whole lot of uh, problems, I think, for all of us. Mm -hmm. America's friends, America's partners, neutrals, everyone. An uncertain U.S., where is it going? How do we deal with that reality? The second thing that has come out unambiguously last year is the rise of China. Yes. China is a great power, and you saw the, the 19th Congress of the Communist Party, where Xi Jinping today is reflecting a more assertive, a more self-assured uh, and confident China. And I think these are the two factors, an uncertain America and an assertive China are beginning to affect us. And I mm -hmm. think it is visible in our own environment. Uh, you talked about the neighborhood. The uh, Prime Minister started out with good intentions, but yes. we've realized how hard it is. In Nepal, we've had uh, issues, Maldives, we have problems, Sri, Sri Lanka, Lanka, everywhere. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that because you're dealing with neighbors with whom there are a lot of domestic issues with which you're involved. Yes. Uh, uh, and those, I think, complicate our life. And I think uh, uh, what is creating a bigger problem is that the China today is a power which is reaching out to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. If I may mm -hmm. add to what you said, if Mr. Yes. Chari will allow. You see, the way I see it, China and Pakistan have more or less a consistent strategic policy towards India. Whereas we seem to oscillate between their policy, which is known. For instance, let me give you an example. I have always noticed that Pakistan's policy to us is one of explosive aggression and tactical appeasement. And we are unprepared for either and then mm. scramble in a mm. sense to keep pace with both. And I can give you umpteen examples, whether it was the bus ride of Mr. Vajpayee and then the invitation after Kargil to uh, President Musharraf or more recently uh, the air dash to Lahore and yes. then the attack on Uripa. So their policy is one of explosive aggression and tactical appeasement to keep us on our toes. We need to anticipate it, expect it, plan for it and plan ahead of it. Mm. Similarly, China's policy, although there is a new assertiveness that we see now, China's policy to India has been unwavering engagement with containment. Because China still believes that it's the Middle Kingdom and it is its destiny hmm. to be one of the most powerful nations in the world. Yes. And it sees India in that sense as a country that it needs to engage with but also contain. Mm -hmm. And that determines its entire policy in our neighborhood. Again, we waffle. We need to be able to respond to China with consistency. I have always quoted this example and they are aware of it. China will be very nice to us and then suddenly say that those from Arunachal Pradesh, <coughs> Indians, will need staple visas. Yes, yes. It but takes us for a moment. Uh, we are caught on the by surprise. Yes. But, but our, is that why, you know, response, an engagement? I'll just end with yes, one sentence. Yes. Our response, in my view, should have been to say immediately that we will give staple visas then to Chinese of Tibetan origin. Then immediately China realizes that mm -hmm. it is dealing with a country that it can't just yeah. constantly mold according to its wishes. Yes. That India has a mind of its own. Yes. And it cannot be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And is it then that is why important to have on one hand an India, China, Russia kind of a meet, but at the other hand you have a quadrilateral that's being formed perhaps and that could also then challenge uh, you know, the other uh, forces in a, and other forces, meaning China in a big way. It is important to keep mm. that balance true, true. and just like China, keep your ties, but at the same time, keep your other options open. I think, <clears throat> I think all these options are available for the government and any government for that matter. And <clears throat> what, 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 I mean, there can be no two opinion as far as the uh, standard operating policy, um, as far as um, uh, national strategy is concerned. 
you know we we have a uh, national agriculture policy we have a national education policy we have so many other national policies even national policy on population hmm. whether it works or not but we don't have a national strategy and security policy yes we have a national uh, nuclear doctrine but we don't have a national security and strategic policy hmm. obviously it's nobody's contention that we can set uh, for the next 50 years this will be our strategy strategy is something that keeps changing yes, keep again evolving, yes. but at the same time we should know what are what are as as uh, ambassador pavan verma said we should know what 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 are our immediate priorities immediate strategies what are our short term strategies and what are our long term strategies mm -hmm. of course the immediate strategies cannot be worked out on uh, for, for a five year plan it yes. has to be day to day basis or whatever it is but we can have a long term strategy mm -hmm. as far as dealing with our internal situation is concerned dealing with our neighborhood is concerned region is concerned and dealing with the global powers are concerned so this has to be done so we we need to have uh, work on both that is we cannot have a china policy uh, looking at uh, china through the american prism it will be very dangerous and detrimental mm. for our own sovereign and self interest yes. but at the same time we cannot tell the americans that you you are free to carry on with your own policy but in the region we have to have our own policy so we will have to work at the same time on both hmm. like for example uh, 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 the government dealing with china on the one hand and then also dealing with japan on the other hand although japan and china have too many contentious issues between them yes they are one of the biggest trading partners also similarly we can be a, one of the biggest part trading partner with uh, china mm. and at the same time we can also work out our strategy just as china is working out its strategy in with pakistan yes. but not calling it a strategic or <coughs> military engagement mm. but they call it china pakistan economic corridor yes so it it's a misnomer it's Absolutely. not an economic corridor it is a strategic corridor yes and china is using pakistan to get an entry and foothold into the indian ocean region mm -hmm -hmm. and indian ocean region the maximum number of choke points are in that region and that is exactly where china is concentrating mm. so it's that this is an issue that we will have to plan Properly Absolutely, and Mr. Raj Mohan, you know, capitalizing on the fact that you are one of the fastest growing economies, you are definitely mm. there among U.S., India, and China. You know, you've got the top three there. Uh, you know, it's China is aggressive. China has these human rights issues, at least as far as Europe is concerned. Uh, even for that matter, even the U.S., they still view it as a country that has human rights issues. Uh, so even on a moralistic ground, they have issues with China on that sense. Can can India then now capitalize on you know on that void? Uh, and also emerge as it is an economy that is growing, uh, and you know capitalize that spot there. Uh, you know, do we see that happening in 2008? See, I think the key what you mentioned is economic growth. Yes. That without that, the rest of the thing just doesn't hold. And I think you talked about many problems that the West has with with China, on trade, on human rights, on you know values and all that. But yet the Chinese market and its attractions today uh, create a logic for. All others, hmm. whether they're west or east or wherever it is. Now, if they can hire a former prime minister of England, David Cameron, as a consultant for their infrastructure fund, they've hired a former commerce minister of Australia f uh, as the lobbyist uh, in lobbyist in Canberra. Yes. So the Chinese political influence is dramatically growing, and it's founded on a their economic economy. growth and global connections. So I think we, while we have stepped out of our isolationist mode last 25 years, we've done the reforms, but I think we're on the way to becoming the third largest economy in nominal terms. Mm. Uh, but the policies need to be aligned with that, that, that we must take full advantage of uh, our uh, economic interdependence with the world and to create the kind of institutions that will overall leverage our growth. But we are still, there is a pull of isolationism, there's a pull of inward orientation it somewhat limits what we can do in the world. For example, everyone wants us to do more on defense cooperation. Yes. But we don't have the institutions ready to, to do that. And I think mm -hmm. that is where we are stuck in a situation. Also, is it, uh, is it also a time to focus on the Indian Ocean region? You have these little nations there. There's a Maldives who signed an FTA with China. Uh, that took 
India by surprise, even though it was in the making for a few months. Uh, you've got Sri Lanka that is in so much debt under China, even if it wants to get out of it and continue its ties with India, it's still finding it difficult because China is using its economic aggression on all these little... And you've got a Nepal that has now got a new left government, uh, you know, uh, is it in I, 2018, do we see India focusing a little bit more on these nations as well, where it could actually actually use its influence? I think that if I were to look at midterm strategies for India, I would expect what China is doing mm. in our neighborhood, mm. but I would not be alarmed by it because there are too many other countervailing cultural overlaps between India and these countries. And while China can be used occasionally by these countries as a negotiating uh, leverage point with India, they all know that overweening Chinese presence hmm. is something that they also fear. They also fear. I, I have been ambassador in Bhutan and I can say to you that culturally uh, and spiritually and from the point of view of religion, they have much more in common perhaps hmm. with the Tibetan as part of China. Yes. But for, for more than one reason, they are, I think, happier to be in much greater proximity with India than to be under Chinese influence. So we have to bear that in mind. But in this context, I want to mention another factor. You see, today China is backing up its psychological assertiveness by a transparently upgraded military capability. And here India is lacking hmm. and that is something which is inextricably linked to foreign policy and a country's stature or as perceived stature in global affairs. India has today become the world's biggest importer of arms because we have not yet built up our indigenous defense production facility. That's right. We need to do much more in terms of creating for a country of our size with our huge coastline with the country being in the most troubled neighborhood of, of the world perhaps. Mm -hmm. A military preparedness that is not only a deterrent in nominal terms, but which also speaks of your might, of, of, your, yes. of your muscle power you know, when yes, required. Yes. If, you, if you combine these two points which uh, both uh, Ambassador and Raja Mohan made, you know, uh, it, it, we, we, no country for that matter and India of course never, we don't have this com uh, comfort of dealing only with foreign policy or strategy anymore. The economic policy, the military policy and the foreign policy, defense policy and foreign policy have all get in got intermixed. Mm. So we cannot segregate one from the other. Okay. Uh, uh, India has not been, India has always been uh, patting itself on the back as a soft power. But the soft power uh, projection also has certain limitations. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we cannot really project as a hawkish country or a <clears throat> militarily oriented country, unlike some of some of the others. And we have never performed this policy of aggrandizement as far as land is concerned or becoming an aggressor. Mm. So in these terms, we cannot give up our own intrinsic strengths of civilizational values and at the same time, we cannot totally negate ourselves from the emerging situations. Yes. So if you consider these two, a mix of what uh, uh, Dr. Rajamohan said and what Ambassador uh, Burma said is a, a, a judicious mix of a strategic pro policy combined with an economic strength, building on our economic strength and also building on the foreign policy and military strength mm -hmm. and, and India need not necessarily be one of the largest uh, producers and consumers of uh, military hardware yes. but we can also be one of the largest exporters of military Indeed hardware we can yes. be. especially especially to those countries which require them the most mm -hmm. and and military hardware also is no longer only associated with warfare. Mm. For example, the amphibian helicopters that J Japan is supplying to India is not for military use, it is for infrastructure use, it is for uh, different purposes, civilian purposes. Mm -hmm. So we can also use all these things. Absolutely. And then uh, there is another huge area where we had one of some of the best strength but we have not utilized it is the space. Mm. A space technology, development of space technology is going to be a win-win situation for all of us. Yes. And the Third and the most important aspect where we should be looking into all these things 
is a very barren area which where we have not gone. The first person to mention this was former Prime Minister P. V. Narasimha Rao who used the term look east. We have always been looking, our foreign policy was Pakistan centric or mm. west centric. It was Narasimha Rao who said look east, but very little was done after that. Okay. So, this Prime Minister has added look east and act east. I think we should start acting east yes. and that is one area which can be an ideal combination of strategic policy, outreach and also economic and military strength. And we have got to do it fast because we China is trying fast. to eat up all the markets China there. Is China, already is there. Already China is already there. there. Is already there. Like a country like a Vietnam would like to, Vietnam, Laos, what Cambodia, all these countries. What we can do is countries. only engage yeah. with them and regain the lost strategic space. That is the maximum that we should start with. All right, Mr. Rajpoon. I think uh, at least I think uh, New Year we are seeing actually we are going to have all the 10 heads of uh, ASEAN uh, are going to be here for the Republic Day celebrations. Mm. So that is going to be quite a, quite a landmark. But I think the 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 problem that is going to be with us for some time and which is going to stop us from really reaching our ambitions of being a great power is the question of connectivity. Mm. Can we do projects in other countries? The Chinese have built, are going to build a port in Hambantota in maybe two years. They have laid a pipeline across Myanmar in two years. But we still do not have an institutional framework to be able to take a port project in some other country. And Hamadota was just offered to India first. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I think the ability to deliver projects and I think a project implementation within India, we are so slow. Yes. It takes years to do anything and outside, I think the contrast between China's ability to deliver and our inability to actually implement projects. I think bridging that gap is going to be a huge necessity hmm. because any neighborhood policy now, connectivity is the most important thing. And, that, and I think that's where we're going to be tested. And since we're talking about challenges, of course, you know, towards being a, a global power, uh, apart from China and, of course, our own hindrances that we have, systemic uh, hindrances that we have, any other challenges that you foresee which is actually stopping us or in some way causing uh, no, I think uh, some that, sort of a hiccup for us? Uh, India has certain calling cards hmm. in the world which we need to strengthen. We are genuinely the world's largest democracy. We live under a regimen of rule of law. We are a growing market, which is always an attraction. We need to reinforce our image of a country with social stability, peace and harmony mm. within. All of these are ongoing goals. I want to mention once again, I am sorry I go back because ultimately the challenge lies there. I am concerned about the all-weather friendship between China and Pakistan directed towards India. Mm. And I will give you three quick examples. Masood Azhar. Hmm. There is no earthly reason why China should exercise a veto on that except to publicly declare hmm. its unconditional support to Pakistan against the interests of India. Blocking our membership of the NSG, Nuclear Suppliers. Group, yes. Or building the One Belt, One hmm. Road initiative through territory which India claims as its own but having actually the audacity to invite India to attend that conference and to have people in India actually say that India should have gone. I mean, I am saying that these are things on which we should have clarity. Mm. And therefore, I believe that initiatives like the quadrilateral summit, India, China, mm. Australia, yes. Japan. And Japan. Uh, India, yes. India, Australia, India, Japan. India, and yes. The, this, these are very important forums for India now because we must think with clarity. Mm. In, for the midterm ahead, we are dealing with a situation on the ground which is verifiable about which we know on our neighborhood and the collusion between two powers in our, against us. We have to build a backup. Okay. And also, also in, in addition to what he has said, uh, there are other areas where we have our own intrinsic strength. That is, uh, some of the best bilateral and multilateral agreements that we have. Uh, and, and these are organizations which depend on us. For example, uh, you mentioned about uh, Indian Ocean uh, region. region yes. Indian Ocean Rim Association, we were the chairperson for three years, but mm. we did precious little. But that is one organization uh, which is waiting for leadership. And we should grab that leadership because Indian Ocean is the only ocean in the whole world which is named, named after, after a country. A country. So, we have a natural right to be masters of that zone, that mm. area. Mm. But I, I think we should really pull up our socks and do something much more in that. Absolutely right. right. Chanakya used to say, if you can't manage mm. your immediate hinterland, 
you should forget well, about should larger global the larger ambitions. Interest. All right. Well, uh, this pretty much sums up what is going to be 2018 for the government, what we'll be seeing ahead, of course, in the year. But thank you so much, Mr. Chari, Mr. Varma, and Mr. Rajamohan for joining me on this interesting discussion here in India's world. Tell us if you liked it. Send us your suggestions and your feedback on indiasworld.feedback at gmail.com. That's it for the moment on India's world. Thank you for joining us.